Welcome to the Martin E. Siegel Theatre Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY and to Prelude 21, uh, Start Making Sense. Um, it is our annual um, theater and performance festival celebrating the work of New York theater artists and ensembles and it's hard enough in normal times to create work for the stage and for uh, spaces inside and outside but in the time of corona we all are faced with exceptional challenges and uh, we are here to celebrate again the extraordinary achievements that come out of the New York theater community. It is time, I think, and we feel, to start making sense to ask uh, questions. Why are we making theater? But also how are we producing it? And for whom? And uh, this is a great investigation again into the um, mechanics uh, of making art uh, in New York City and we also invited uh, theater ensembles from around the US from Detroit and Cincinnati, St. Louis and uh, Philadelphia, uh, New Orleans um, to join us and um, this will be an extraordinary look into uh, what is on the minds of artists right now. We also have uh, many panel discussions. Uh, we have uh, an award which we're giving out uh, to honor uh, uh, outstanding members of the New York theater community, so I would like to all of you to uh, join in and uh, get an insight of what uh, is happening.
Hello, everyone, and welcome. And thank you, Daisy, for that really extraordinary opening, uh, which we'll talk more about a little bit later. Uh, I'm David Bruin. I'm one of the curators of Prelude this year, and I'm also the executive artistic director of Celebration Barn Theater, which is located in South Paris, Maine. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm currently located in what is colonially known as Brooklyn on the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenny Lenape and their ancestors, past, present, and future. Before Daisy returns and we hear more work, I want to acknowledge the land we collectively occupy and its digital counterpart. The following acknowledgement was originally written by Adrian Wong of the company Spider Web Show, and with Wong's encouragement, has been slightly edited to mark this occasion. Since our activities are shared digitally on the internet, let's take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking that we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints and contribute to climate change, which dis disproportionately affects indigenous people worldwide. We invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to care for one another, to protect our earth and water, and to consider our roles in decolonization, land return, and reparations. With that in mind, I'm thrilled to have Daisy here at Prelude. Uh, and I just wanna say a couple of reasons why I find her project so compelling. Um, I've been really interested in the relationship between artists and their predecessors and the ways that certain kinds of inspirations and uh, background figures and predecessors become collaborators over time. So as an example, you know, last year in Prelude 2020, Miranda Heyman presented a project uh, called B.B. Brecht, which is an ongoing kind of engagement and reworking and thinking through and acting upon, uh, you know, the work and legacy of Bertolt Brecht. So um, for Daisy, you know, for several years, as she'll talk about, she's been working uh, with the work of uh, St. Hildegard of Bingen, who was a 12th century nun, who was not only a poet, theologian and composer, but also a botanist, herbalist uh, and healer. And really, I mean, that strikes him at the heart of my interest, which is the way in which in the medieval world, and especially for Hildegard, uh, I mean, she's really representative of this, the way in which art, learning, and healing all formed one cohesive way of being in the world. Um, and so as some of you may know, you know, Daisy is not only an artist and performer herself, but also a leader of a project called Voice Cult, uh, which is open to participation. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. The final thing I want to say about Hildegard and Daisy's engagement and ongoing collaboration with Hildegard is she really helps us understand or prompts us to think about what we can learn from the earth and how the workings of nature can help us understand how we relate to one another. And this, I think, has a lot of resonance with current movements. I'm thinking here particularly of the work of Adrienne Marie Brown and her concept of emergent strategy, which she outlined in her book uh, the, in 2018 of the same title. So uh, with all that in mind, I'm just thrilled to be able to share this work. And uh, I now want to turn it back over to Daisy. She's going to give a live performance of a chant that Hildegard wrote uh, called Favus Distillans, which means a dripping honeycomb. Uh, so with that in mind, I'm going to hand over the screen back to her, uh, and I'll be back to talk more with her after this performance.
Thanks, Daisy, so much for that performance. And while um, Daisy kind of collects and comes back, uh, I just want to read the translation of the Latin text that you heard. This is actually Daisy's translation. So the, the first kind of verse is a dripping honeycomb was Ursula the Virgin. We're going to talk more about Ursula when she returns, who longed to embrace the Lamb of God with honey and milk under her tongue. And then there's a bit of a refrain that repeats occasionally in a garden bursting with ripe fruit amongst the blossoming of flowers. She collected a swarm of virgins, virgins around herself. And then it goes on in this most noble sunrise rejoice daughter of Zion. And then we return to the garden with the bursting ripe fruit and the blossoming flowers and the swarm of virgins. And then we head on glory to the mother and to the daughter and to the Holy spirit. And then we conclude again with the invocation of a garden bursting with fruit, blossoming flowers, a swarm of virgins. Um, so it's a really terrific text. And when Daisy comes back, we'll talk a little about that and a little about the album um, that she's in the process of making of Hildegard's original work. Uh, and then we'll see a music video uh, and a little, you know, from another track on the album. So hello, welcome back. <gasps> hello, and thank you. Thank uh, you for all that. No, it's fine. I'm sorry. I was fraying there. The, uh, unlike your beautiful outro, I was like, you know, <laughs> collapsing at the seam and the thing. So wait, tell us a little bit about Ursula. I know you and I <sighs> talked about this and then I didn't want to do it just, you know, any injustice by <laughs> doing it up. So you, you should really be wrong. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. So Ursula. Um, so yeah, I was singing a song about Ursula, the virgin, and we can talk about virginity a little bit um, later because I, I, I want to. Uh, <laughs> so so this is one of 13 songs, 13 chants that Hildy, I hope it's okay, I call her Hildy, that's what she likes, um, that Hildy wrote for Ursula. So um, Ursula, I mean, there's there's this legend about this, this British princess Ursula. So she lived, if she lived, maybe she lived, maybe she did live, uh, several hundred years before Hildegard even. And um, she was in the legend or in reality, we don't really know, a British princess and uh, was supposed to marry a prince, I guess for you know legal or land reasons or whatever. But she was like, daddy, daddy, no, I wanna marry Jesus. And he said, okay. And she's like, oh my God, I'm so in love with Jesus. And then she gathered uh, virgins around her, other virgins who were also in love with Jesus. And there were either 11 of them or 11,000 of them, depending on, there was a little Latin translation problem that happened <laughs> uh, along the line. So it's more fun to say like 11,000 virgins. So Ursula and her 11,000 friends decided to go on this world tour of um, virginity and uh, loving Jesus. And so, you know, they went to all these different places and they visited the Pope and he was like, you guys are great. And I, I feel like I am telling this in a sort of drunk history version. I'm, I'm, not, <laughs> I'm not drunk, but there's like this colloquial kind of way of, um, you know, telling this story, which I, which I do like. But anyway, so um, they were on their virginity world tour and there were all these miracles. The main one being that I guess they were on, I, don't, I guess the first miracle, they were all on one ship. I don't know. But they sailed across a big sea in one day. So they caught some really good wind. And that was a miraculous thing. And um, then uh, their fate did not turn out to be so great because um, they were all brutally murdered. And, you know, by apparently the man that Ursula was supposed to marry and she, you know, cast him off. And so they were all like beheaded and, and apparently the, Ursula was hit by an arrow and there are a lot of paintings, beautiful paintings of like this arrow on Ursula's neck. And so this very bloody end. Um, and so in Hildegard's telling of these tales, um, her virginity and the virginity of all the virgins was highly, highly praised. And then it gets really bloody at the end too. There's there's a, a chant at the end of the Ursula songs called Cum Vox Sanguinis with the mm -hmm. voice of the blood. And the blood kind of rises up and has this voice and just praises um, praises the divine. So that's, so Hildy was into it and uh, wrote a lot of chants for, for this woman and these ladies. Um, there's a lot of time back there, but um uh why don't we 
move to the video a little bit. Uh, okay. I know you want to say a little bit about it. So why don't you, well, well, I'm off the introduction team. So I'll turn over to you to introduce it and then we'll, we'll play that. Okay, that's great. Yes, so we have a video to show. And uh, it was really wonderful to you know, be, thank you so much for, for choosing me to be a part of this festival because it really uh, motivated me. It's like, okay, we need, to, we need to make a video. I do have an album that's coming out next year. And we're really excited about that, but we didn't yet have any videos for this album, which, which the album will need. And so uh, this was a great motivator. And the person who I chose, to collaborate with first uh, to make this video. And, and by the way, the chant that you hear is already a collaboration between myself, Dick Connett, and Jeff Cook. Both of these gentlemen do many, many things and are composers themselves. So there's already a lot of collaboration going on in this track. Um, but the person I wanted or the organization I wanted to collaborate with for this video was um, the Joshua Light Show. And Joshua White and Stan Schneer of Joshua Light Show. And for those of you who don't know, God, I had to go and like take notes on this beforehand because what the Joshua Light Show has done for so many years is um, so iconic and epic and we all know, uh, we, and we all have a little part of it. So um, back in the 60s and 70s, some folks got together, I guess sort of organized by, by Joshua White and started playing with uh, with analog things like oil, water, colors, pure color. They all had these backgrounds from Carnegie Mellon and, and art directing backgrounds and directing backgrounds, but also with a, a keen sense of, of visual art. And so they created these things with, um, with reflections, with mirrors, with uh, oils, liquid and light that were then projected onto the screens for live music shows. So it was all happening live, all the mixing, all the analog making and projecting was happening live. It was not like they were showing something. It was something that was being made in the moment for these shows. And I just want to kind of read, I had to write them all down because they it blows my mind to think about them. So in the 60s and 70s, okay, so here's the shows. Here's the acts that this, this light show was behind. Janis Joplin, The Grateful Dead, The Who, Jefferson Airplane, The Doors, Frank Zappa, Lou Reed, Ravi Shankar, and Jimi Hendrix, to name a few. So <laughs> I've, um, I've actually known Joshua White my whole life. Um, what is created, uh, and they, they're still creating, they, they just did an amazing show a couple of years ago at Skirball, and there was a show in the Planetarium. So I've known Joshua White for a very long time, but I thought, what about these psychedelic colors um, that are made from you know these these analog materials and digitally mixed together. But what about that with Hildegard and a sense of like these natural shapes that are made by humans and that happen naturally in nature? Like this is not a digital thing. They, the the colors and shapes weren't created digitally. It's like what happens when you drop a thing into a thing and then go like that with it or whatever. Um, so how is this connected to Hildegard? I mean, there's a sense of great pleasure. There's synesthesia, which I think Hildegard was feeling a whole bunch. Hmm, yeah. um, and uh, the this video that you're going to see is a work in progress. At some point, I myself am going to be inserted into it tastefully um, in an abstract way. But amazing, beautiful work was done by uh, Joshua White and Stan Schneer to, to make this video happen. And... Um, this particular chant is one where Hildegard is comparing Mary to a tree. Excellent. Virgin All right. We'll, yeah. we'll let um, our expert technician, Jackie, pull us away and pull up the video.
Excellent. Um, <laughs> I, Jackie, thank you for bringing us back from the void also. Um, uh, what, well, I want you to say more about the song. I guess I'm really interested in this idea of color because the, the mm -hmm. lyrics begin with Viridissima Virga, right? That's the first line. And um, Veriditas, the noun form of the superlative uh, Veridissima, oh. means, you know, like, it, it could mean greenness, right? But it has this whole other set of connotations like uh, vigor, uh, liveliness, um, kind of flowering. So, and actually, if you Google the word often, um, it just comes up with Hildegard. I mean, it's so yeah. tied to her in the way that alienation is, or estrangement is hooked or yoked to Brecht in a certain kind of way. So I'm just curious, mm -hmm. I mean, what does that word mean for you? Um, and and can it help us enter the work in any way? Or am I just fetishizing this like one little lexical, <laughs> error, you know, <laughs> curiosity that I've like pegged on to? <laughs> well, I think it should be a fetish, honestly. <laughs> I'm sure there's a subreddit for for that somewhere. <laughs> I, do. I mean, and in in that sense, celebrated in the fullest. Um, oh yeah. So, veriditas, greenness, kind of greenness, but so much more. Like you said, I really think of it as like forward motion, life force, the transformation of life force, like good vibes. Someone who has really good energy, man, you, the, the Veriditas is strong with you today. You know, so <laughs> we, we could, that, that is said in the Veriditas uh, fetish community frequently. No, but um, yeah, so Hildegard was very obsessed with this. It shows up in many of her chants. It shows up in this one that we, um, that we you know, just heard. And it, wonderfully in this video, I'm so happy about this, um, Stan, for that one moment, the Veriditate, when I say that, everything really goes green, really green for a second, and then moves on through all the colors. Um, yeah, so it's the force of growth, I think. Mm -hmm. Growth in them. I don't know if there's entropy in it. I think it's it's more forward motion. And she... I'm thinking of so many other chants where where this comes up, and another one that's coming to mind right now is uh, she's talking about the sun and how great the sun is, and she says that encircling the sun is also this green energy, hmm. um, and it's yeah, it's in a beautiful chorus. And I I mean, I'm looking outside my window right now where there's where there's a tree. It's dark, but I can see the the leaves. Um, the repeating patterns of leaves, like the the natural forms in the universe, I think, is also part of this, like like crystalline forms, uh, analog sources, the the shape of humans. We all have this. Um, I was reading not too long ago in a um, in a, God, it's this really great old book on singing written by one of the Italian masters. And there's just like so much amazing stuff in there. But he was talking about how regular vibration builds and irregular mm -hmm. vibration destroys. And he's talking about, you know, pr getting a good singing voice. And we actually do. We really want to have regular vibrations. Like like when there's a lot of, when our words are overpronounced and things get stuck here and there's a place where we can get in our voices where there is like this little light source and it's really regular and it's dancing and we can sing on that. And there's a veriditas in that too. It's like when somebody's in flow. Um, yeah. So those are, those are my thoughts on, on that. What do you think? I mean, I, well, when I was trying to like think about it over the weekend, you know, she she does sometimes use it in invocations of the Virgin Mary. You know, the Virgin mm -hmm. Mary is very important to her. Yeah. And I do think that there's a sense in which, if I had to summarize the vision that her work presents, well, at least one of them might be that Hildegard sees nature as one ongoing immaculate conception. Mm. And which is also maybe at the same time a kind of assumption in the sense of 
that w when when Mary is assumed into heaven, you know, and so there's both a kind of entry mm -hmm. and there's a flowing in and a flowing out that's constant. And it is, um, well, I don't know. I mean, now I can't, now I can't actually think about it without thinking about your sense of virginity, not your personal <laughs> sexual history, but like what, what we talked about at one point, which was what virginity means to her, which is not necessarily like a sense of purity that must be maintained in order to satisfy a certain kind of patriarchal purience, but a sense of um, contentment. I mean, you talk, well, I mean, what did, mm. you mentioned a little bit yeah. earlier, I mean, what does virginity mean to you? Because that really blew my hair back when we started talking. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if Hildy thought that this I mean, that this is what virginity meant to her. I, I mean, I think that for her, for her, everything was a metaphor for another thing. Like you were just talking about the veriditas of, of the, the world and like the immaculate conception of the world. Yes, she was definitely with this. But she, you know, she was very, very judgy about Eve um, mm -hmm. in, in a lot of ways. Uh, but so I read this, I think it was in um, a book by a Jungian therapist, a wonderful Jungian therapist named Marion Woodman. And there is a book called The Pregnant Virgin, which is about um, the development of the, of the female psyche. Really wonderful, really beautiful. And she talks a lot about this. And she says that virginity has nothing to do with sexuality, with, with the presence or absence of sexuality in a person. She said that uh, a woman who is a virgin is a woman who belongs to no other person being man, whatever, than herself. She belongs to herself from the inside. Mm. I'm getting goosebumps as I say this. Um, so she belongs to herself and there's an integrity, integritate. This is a, actually also a word that comes up in Hildegard's chants all the time. In fact, it was in the first chant that I sang tonight, Virga Mediatrix, where she's saying that um, Mary is the mediating branch between this earth and heaven and, and also, you know, between all, all things. But um, yeah, so virginity not being this purity, but this sense of belonging and this uh, knowing who you are and being that person. Um, speaking of knowing yourself, being yourself, I want to ask you a little biographical question because um, I know that you took a break from performing for a while. And I, my sense from my peer group, which is not representative in any kind of global way, is that there's a lot of people thinking, you know, do I stay in the field? Do I go? Do I keep working in the industry? Do I leave it? I mean, you know, someone we both know, Bill Camp, famously kind of left acting for a little bit. I think he worked in a mechanic shop. But in any case, I'm, I'm curious to ask you kind of, why did you leave? And then what brought you back? What was that animating you know, maybe even Viridian, that's right, <laughs> force that brought you back to performance and singing or however, however, whatever rubric you might think about the work that you do. Um, yeah. So when I was in college, I went to Manhattan School of Music. I mean, I actually went to Sarah Lawrence in Oxford and did a whole bunch of like theological and liberal artsy and mm -hmm. psychological things during that degree and then went to Manhattan School of Music and specialized in uh, music by living composers. So a lot of it was really tough and difficult and complex and the rhythms were hard. And it's like the, it's, a lot of this stuff is really atonal. And there was this world at the time um, of, and it, it still exists a whole bunch in Europe and, and here too, but of like just a world that really values complexity and difficulty uh, as a, maybe a sense that the composer has gotten to a certain place intellectually, or it's a statement on where the world is, but I specialized in that. And I had a, you know, a, a career here um, and in Europe a little bit, but mainly here performing very complex, very difficult music. And I kind of lost the sense of like what the point was. And uh, I just felt like I don't feel like pushing myself to do this more. I feel like incubating. I feel like doing something else. And I was interested in medicine, but I was interested in animals. So I worked at an animal hospital for a while. Uh, and I actually still work there 
one shift a week to stay in touch with that world Mm -hmm. because it's really great. It's totally different. It's the world of really extreme customer service. So uh, difficult in its own way, but, uh, but it's just a very different world than this freelancer world. So I did that for a while. I worked at the Apple store. I sold shoes. I sold dresses, a lot of customer service stuff. Um, but I got back into music when I had this kind of leftover gig in Vienna with a really great ensemble there. And I realized that I loved being in rehearsal more than anything else. Hmm. That was like my favorite. It wasn't performing. It was being in rehearsal and like being with other musicians and figuring things out. There was such a joy in that. And I did love the performance there, but I came back here and I thought, okay, so if I, if I'm starting from zero and I'm rebuilding, what do I want it to to look like? What do I want it to feel like? And the feel like question was really important. Um, I have studied Indian Raga for a long time with different teachers. And, you know, that is uh, music that is sort of synonymous with spirituality and about sitting with very long tones. And what happens when we sit with the same note for an evening, for a week, for a month, for a century, for millennia? What happens if we're just in this drone zone? And so I was like, okay, I want music that feels like that. I want to have drones around me. I want to play drones. I want to be in this relationship with with pitches that are fixed and that stay. Because when you do that, you feel it in your body. Like you can feel, I don't know if you guys can hear it. It's, It's hard to hear, but if you were in the same room with me when I was singing with that crystal bowl, there are these crazy difference tones that come into the room like and you feel them and they hit you back here and they hit you here. And like when you sing a fifth really in tune, it brings this whole harmonic spectrum and it's just math. So uh, that was what I was interested in rebirthing myself into. And Hildegard's music came up very quickly. And I started singing Hildegard with the drones and also started going and, you know, Hildegard uh, chants the way we have them. There's no rhythms. So I started to go and make really um, bold executive decisions about, okay, this is going to be like this. This is going to be like this. This is, I'm putting my stamp on this. I'm like writing my own breath into this. And that felt so empowering after singing the music of composers, other composers for a very long time. It's like, okay, I'm I'm able to c- collaborate with Hildy on this. So uh, I started singing Hildegard and collaborated with some friends and uh, then had uh, this random gig at this place in Brooklyn called House of Yes. And they liked Hildegard. They're like, hey, we can get with medieval music. We want medieval music to be a part of uh, a part of our shows and a part of our life here as a certain sort of thing, a vibe. Uh, many different things are presented there. Many wonderful different things on many parts of the sacred and profane spectrum and this was more on the sacred end of the spectrum that then you could mix with um with beautiful creative profanity there so i started performing there a bunch and then it just you know when one thing kind of gets rooted in one place it can grow to other places and so it just grew into this um this character who performs hildegard and and performing hildegard in all these different random walks or not random um multifaceted walks of life and where did voice call emerge in this journey um <laughs> and you can say a little bit about it i've mentioned it a couple of times but I'm- yeah <laughs> yeah so okay so voice call you know it was part of uh that that was birthed in house of yes um as a large scale uh singing exercise workouts singing class singing school like uh, a choir but not a choir where everybody has their own parts but it's just kind of an improvised choir in the moment but we uh we had fun with making it and we branded it as this um religious ceremony that people can walk into and uh take part in and they're welcomed into it and i became the uh, high priestess like of this of this cult of people who are singing and the divinity is uh, not something outside of us. It's actually something within us. Your own divinity is your own voice. And when you sing, you heal yourself. And uh, it was body and hilarious and sometimes really sacred. And, and we were all figuring out what was going on. But um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun at House of Yes. And then, you know, the whole pandemic happened. So 
<laughs> as we all know. So I took it online because I thought and I knew that people needed things to do and they needed ways to feel better. And what I know from teaching voice to many, many students and my own experience, if I open my mouth to sing, I'm going to enter into a different state. I'm going to change my energy. I'm going to change the feel around me. And I really need that. So I started offering voice cult online like three times a week, um, free for, and I offered that for the entire uh, year in 2020. And it was, it started out being, I would kind of teach raga and it was, you know, singing with a drone and, and, but then I started to realize, you know what, I'm with these people who are coming back a couple of times a week and I want to start to figure out a way to teach them Hildegard. What if I bring these chants into it? And so um, I gave people sheet music. I gave them their own drones to download. And I said, okay, we're going to learn this chant today or four lines in this chant. And for a lot of people who don't read music, that can be a very daunting task, especially when it's in Latin and it's in this, you know, it can be something that is just so foreign. But if you teach it like it's in, like it's in kindergarten and you just go line by line and turn it into a sing songy thing and, and the, the uh, practice of repetition, doing the same, even two notes, then three notes over and over, then four notes over and over, then five notes, six, seven, and and putting it into a line, it's like how you would teach a song to a kid. Um, so I started teaching Hildegard to these people and they were learning it and really awesome and amazing. And it became a community of people who were, um, we all got to know each other a little bit and they all know each other really well now. I did turn it into a funded thing, so it's on Patreon now, but it's this really beautiful group of humans. I actually saw them just before we uh, we came online here, and they're like I, I, their family. They're my Hildegard family. We love these chants. We love doing them over and over again. We love coming back to a chant to work on a chant. So we all have these very deep relationships now. With God, I don't know. I've taught I'm getting goosebumps. I've taught probably thirty chants 30 hildegard chants to these to these people and they know them well and um it's usually just me singing with everybody muted but sometimes we you know everybody turns on their mics uh to sing all together at once and that is a practice that we call the the cloister fuck because it's like a cloister and it's a mess and uh so <laughs> so yeah it's a really um it's a really gorgeous thing to get to do. And I feel really lucky that it's like something that happened and something that still happens. Um, and we'll make sure there's like a link in the comments because people, cause, cause people can still, now you've developed these relationships, but you are welcoming new people to be a part of the yes. group. Yeah. Always. You can always come and uh, yeah, you don't, you can come try it out. You can come feel it out and just come seeing really more important than anything else is when people sing, they feel better. Like, and that is what that is what I want to give. If you know, if I can get people into a, an altered, better state uh, with themselves and their own voices, that's golden. So come do it. We're there. Um, I can't time. I have many questions. So I can get it. Um, I'm sure. I mean, one of the things that we talked about that animates this question. Uh, who was uh, a for, and what did you learn from her? You know what? I'm so sorry. Things have gotten a little bit uh, garbly online. Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. Oh, I hear you. I hear you clearly now. You can, can you hear me now? Please, yes. Can you please repeat that question? Yeah, no, no, of course. So I was asking um, if you could tell us who Sister Benedicta Ward is <gasps> and how she came into your life and what you learned from her. Oh, yes. <laughs> Yes, well, she was the first person who introduced me to Hildy. Uh, so I was, it was in my third year um, of my Sarah Lawrence education. And for that year, I went to Oxford to you know, go and just have that whole experience, which was miraculous and beautiful. And I studied French 
and theology there. So it was just a whole lot of theology. And, and it's a very up close and personal system there. You, you go and see your teachers uh, who are called tutors there. And it's a one-on-one -on -one thing. And every week they give you some stuff to read and then you write an essay on it and then you bring it back. So Sister Benedicta Ward, and I, you know, I hope she's still alive. I, Sister, are you there? I don't, she was just this wonderful, wonderful kind of badass theologian nun who was, uh, everyone told me, they're like, she's a big deal. She's kind of a big deal. And I, you know, she had a formidable uh, brain and spirit, incredible heart. And with her, we, uh, I studied, I wanted to study the mystics in altered states and the theology of sex. Um, so, uh, she, so Hildy came up, um, Hildy came up, Gregory of Nyssa came up, uh, uh, Julian of Norwich came up. So many of the, the gentlemen and, and ladies throughout history in, in the, so it wasn't like mystics of all time. It was mystics in the Christian church and the Catholic church. Uh, but these people who entered into altered states and, and whose stories were um, believed and they weren't like, you know, burned at the stake for that. And so they were, uh, Hildegard was one of them. And uh, what I really got out of that year of studying with Sister Benedicta Ward was how intimacy between people and how we work on that and, and how little or much we value that, like that is a spiritual practice. It can be a spiritual practice. Intimacy between like one, myself and, you know, one person or a group of people. And my intimacy skills are kind of like my spirituality skills. Hmm. They're kind of inter intertwined. And that is in the realm of, uh, you know, we were looking at in the realm of sex, but then sex, you know, it can just be so much more than sex when you're talking about the mystics. So yeah, Sister Benedict Award, love her. Um, I think she is still around for what's, I mean, well, she's definitely around because she's like with you, you know, and yeah. um, she's here, but I think she's also, uh, uh, yeah, li living and breathing as well on this earth in addition to whatever may happen in the life to come. Um, as we're like closing on the hour mark, I mean, I guess I'm curious, we talked a little about this earlier today, you and I were on a panel with some other artists and, and people from Prelude, but what's, what's inspiring you right now? Mm -hmm. And what is it kind of inspiring you mm -hmm. to want? And let me, maybe, let me give you some context for, maybe I'll answer that question for myself, you know, briefly while you can think about it or, or not think about it. But you know, for me, when I arrived in New York, I got to New York in 2009. Um, I was really invested in the institution I worked for, which was Signature Theater. I was really interested in how to run theaters better. I'm not an artist, but um, I've worked with many of them. It's always a it's a privilege to to serve them. And then I, I feel like for me in the last year and a half ish, but maybe especially the last 15 months, it I've been like, how can we how can the, how can our interactions, how can our getting together, how can our habits of assembly be renewed and be practiced without the institution always mediating the interaction? Mm. I've just been really inspired by various working groups. I mean, voice call is definitely in this vein where it's like, yes, there's, you know, um, people are valuing your leadership and your labor and they're paying you, but it's a group of people who have all come together and started this practice that's not affiliated or, you know, a part of some other marketing plan, even though I now run an institution, you know, I have that responsibility, but on the horizon, it's like, well, how can we get out of these things and just kind of get back together? I really think, you know, the, the monastic life is a kind of inspiration for me in that sense, even though of course it was embedded in this larger institution, but what they were able to achieve in terms of, having art as a part of their everyday practice, having agriculture and healing and learning and study. I mean, it just still amazes me. And they get a massively bad rap, the the monastics and the medieval people in general, but that's like a whole other um, conversation. So I'm, I'm curious for you, you know, especially of late, where are you finding inspiration and what is it, how has it affected what you want? Hmm. 
So I get, God, I love my students so much. I love them so hard. They inspire me all the time. And I mean, this maybe in, in a lot of ways sounds self-centered, but I'm, I'm working on like figuring out what my own voice is mm. and having the, the courage to do that, having the courage even to like on a, after being trained the way I was, you know, writing on a score, this is how I'm going to sing this. And that being like the beginning. And I'm, I'm kind of a slow bloomer with a lot of inspiration and in, in knowing what I want. I'm very, very interested in helping people get rid of all the stuff that's blocking here. That's what every voice mm. lesson is about. And I can feel it. Like I can feel it. My students can feel it. So that that movement is what inspires me. And that's the same thing as me becoming courageous to start creating my own compositions, which I'm doing with within um, this album and the, I mean, a couple albums down um, down the row, you know, it becomes more and more of my voice. And like I get to collaborate with Hildy to find my voice and then get into my own voice more. Um, I really don't think about institutions that much. I, I myself feel like this could be my own little cell. And I live here by myself. I have my dog and I, you know, I, I do, I'm, I'm lucky to get to do what I do and like be in my own life and thoughts and um, making beautiful sounds and helping other people find the courage to make sounds that are um, more real. <sighs> yeah, that's kind of a roundabout it's a roundabout answer. And I was so deeply inspired by the other artists in the talk today and, and seeing, um, yeah, just seeing what other people have to say, what they need, how deep the struggle is, uh, and, and this really beautiful levity that was in, that was in our talk, mm. um, and so much of it just had to you know, boil down to like just doing the thing, moving, making the art, singing, changing the energy. That's, I think, always what's going to inspire me the most. How do we change the energy right now for the better? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Well, it's easy for me because, I, I, again, I'm not an artist and, and I'm a little bit of an academic sometimes. And sometimes just the complexity of the entire situation overwhelms me. And by situation, it, it can be something I have to do like, okay, I got to deal with this budget. Right. Or it can be the economics of theater in the United States, which are, you know, its own peculiar calculus. Um, but then, as you said, sometimes, and I think what, what I'm interested in artists who do, I mean, I'm interested in two things. On the one hand, I'm interested in like complete mess and um, craziness. And uh, one of the reasons I picked, uh, Niall Harris as a, as a curator in our chain was just like, if, if you see Niall's work, it, it, someone watched it one time and told me it was like the internet threw up on their screen, you know, but on the other hand, I really like artists who find that kind of simplicity, right? Like you just touched your neck and it's like, it's just right here. It's just this thing, this space, this airflow, that's the thing. And, and that little, you know, piece becomes, a, the, the, what, 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 what might one say the little unit in this greater fractal about how to move forward, about how to survive, about how to live on amidst a really set of brutal conditions. Again, the brutality is not um, distributed equally by any stretch of imagination, but that kind of access to a practice um, is really, it, it can be really, really important. I mean, it can save your life, I think. Um, totally. Without, um, so Speaking of what you want to do, um, we're closing on the hour mark. This has been really extraordinary. I want I want you to be able to tell people, you know, what are you doing next? Um, what's what's happening with the album? When is the release party? Like, what's going on in your life? Um, and yeah, this is the chance to plug, baby. Ah, yeah. So, well, I mean, we talked about voice cult a bunch, and I wanted to say, um, truly, truly, truly. Uh, there's thank you for uh, you know uh, for putting Jackie for putting the voice cult online the Patreon for voice cult um, here I, I really appreciate that people can go there but uh, that's a thing where you kind of read about it and then you have to sign up to get all the stuff uh, 
If you want to sing, just email me. Just email me personally. Sing at voicecult.org. I will not deny you. Please come sing. So uh, I want it to be up close and personal and, and for you. And then, you know, if you love it, we can talk about it. Uh, so I do have an album coming out, uh, volume one, Hildy album with many different arrangements of Hildy uh, is coming out ooh, sometime next year on Story Sound Records. And I, I love this record label so, so much. It's it's more of a record label for like a kind of singer, songwriter, quirky singer, songwriter uh, stuff. And then there's like Hildegard on there and a couple other um, you know, things that are more in the classical world, but it's really a record label of um, some <laughs> beautiful outliers that I love dearly. And I know a lot of these pe people personally. So that will be coming out. Um, I am so very slowly re-entering the gigging scene. I was actually just in Europe, though, performing with a really un amazing ensemble named Klang Forum Wien, doing incredibly complex music. And that was super fun. And that was great. I got to sing Hildi in a monastery in Italy. Um, and I met a lot of monks there and uh, people living the, the real monastic life. Um, God, what else is up? You know, I'm just going to like make some beautiful sounds and and figure out when they go into the world. But I, I'm teaching up a storm and uh, moving, moving through this period gently and slowly and keeping to myself, not chasing after gigs right now or ever really. But I'm just kind of figuring out what's up. And when I know, I will get a message from myself. <laughs> um, well, before I really like roll the credits on this thing, I have to say thank you to Robert Woodruff because he actually, you know, brought you into my life. Oh my and, God. Um, I have many fond memories of what now seems like a million years ago, uh, but I think it was 2017. Um, and just watching and listening to you work in those two weeks was absolutely, you know, just really... <laughs> knocked me out uh and also i th i thought i was like way not cool enough to <laughs> talk to you <laughs> i was like oh, i'm just a nerdy dramaturg I, I look tired i'm sweating all the time and um but yeah i just want to shout out to him um uh, i think he might be in arizona but he could also be in southeast asia i mean it's it's but he's always with me and i feel him much like hildegard with us when we talk so um i i had to acknowledge him in some way. Uh, yes, I shout out to him too. He's wonderful. I was thinking about him the other day and thinking about what he did in rehearsals and how he was just so deeply <laughs> into what was going on with his physicality. And, and he was super wonderful. God, that was an Evan Zaporin project too. Yeah, yeah. With Bill Camp. And that was also very biblical. Book yes. of Job. Book Unfortunately, of Job. I don't know if it'll ever happen, but um, alas, some things in this world are are just lost or too, maybe too precious uh, for it to happen. No, it, it was really magical. Although I remember now we're just getting in a little inside baseball, but I remember Robert, as someone will know, is very intense rehearsal. And then he will start throwing pages around and then <laughs> we'll go through a whole 15 minute section. And then uh, Ashley Tata, who I should also shout out to is in that room. And I would just try to scurry around like little, I don't know, little servants, you know, like in Shakespeare, when you're like those guys following the king or whatever, trying to put the pages back together. But <laughs> I'm, I'm sure there's like a metaphor in there somewhere, whether it's good or bad, I have no idea. But um, uh, no, it's been it's been great to reconnect after all this time. Uh, I told Frank and I'll, I'll, you know, I don't mind telling people we, we tried to get you into Prelude one year and it didn't work. So I'm really glad this could happen. Um, is there anything else you want to say, Daisy, before I give some like final final readout? Oh, I mean, I think just gratitude. And I'm so, so excited to experience the rest of this festival. This is amazing. This is like opening night and I'm honored to be here. And I, I cannot wait to see what, uh, to see the variety and the brilliance that I know is, is going to be the rest of this. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, um, Siegel Center. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Andy, Tanvi, Jackie. Uh, it was really beautiful, really an honor to be here. So thank you.
Awesome. Yeah. Thank you to, to as you said, to Frank Hinkshire. Uh, he's the executive director of the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center and the founder and impresario of Prelude. Uh, it's been for, for me, it's been a real pleasure to work with him over the last three years to our producers, Andy Lerner and Tommy Shaw. Uh, thanks to Jackie for the excellent tech support to the Lucille Lortel Foundation for their support of Prelude. Uh, and finally, Daisy, thanks for you, your visionary work. Uh, I always want to know what you're doing. So uh, I hope this isn't the last time. And thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of the festival. And until next time, peace.